Welcome, everyone. My name is Jordana, and this is Scott, and we're here to talk to you about the latest innovations in cloud data loss prevention. First, in order of business, we'll be using the Dory app within the Cloud Next app to take questions, and then at the end of the talk, we'll be going through those. Josh is our moderator, and he'll be helping you through those. Anything we don't get to today, we'll be covering or responding to you before the end of the week. So in this session, we'll be giving a quick overview of cloud data loss prevention, followed by a review of the latest things we've launched since the last time we were here. Scott will then demo all of the new features, and then we'll end with your questions. So why are we here today? For those of you new to cloud DLP, it provides a collection of tools to classify and detect for sensitive information, anonymize and transform text and images, and measure your protection with risk analysis. Why did we build cloud data loss prevention? We made DLP to help you understand and manage your sensitive data. We made DLP for your data compliance officers, your data engineers, your academic researchers, who all need help to assure compliance with policies and regulations. And most importantly, they need help to protect your users' data. So how do we do that? DLP is made up of three pillars, the first of which is discovery and classification. A compliance officer whose job is to ensure that credit card data is protected can use DLP to tokenize the data. But to be really sure they've done a thorough job, they need to conduct audits of all the persisted data in your company to make sure that credit cards don't show up anywhere surprising. DLP can help this compliance officer find and identify credit card data, along with many other types of PII across BigQuery, Google Cloud Storage, and Data Store, and even data not stored in the cloud. The findings can then be used to take remediation steps, such as anonymization, which takes us to our next pillar. DLP provides support to de-identify text and images in both structured and unstructured contexts. We host a number of transformation techniques such as masking, deletion, and format preserving encryption to obscure your data while minimizing your data loss. Here's an example of a user combining the first two product pillars. As you can see, we have a loan application with several bits of PII. On the right-hand side is what the image and what the documents look like after they've been run through DLP. As you can see, our detectors have automatically identified the phone, the email, and the social security number at the top. We've color-coded the findings so that viewers might know what was redacted, but not what exactly private information was there. Treating rich documents as images and anonymizing in them this way is a great technique to protect your users' data. But we aren't quite done yet, which brings us to our next pillar. A medical researcher is conducting a study, and their ethics board has asked that they remove all ability to tie the secret lab result back to the patients before publishing their research. They've removed all of the identifying information, the social security numbers and the ages and the dates of birth, and they've left no direct identifiers behind. But to be sure that their patient's identity is protected, they turn to risk analysis. In this extremely simple example, we can see that there's outliers, and that in this case, the job title field is really identifying, even though normally this wouldn't be considered PII. Risk analysis helps users find data like this automatically, data that is actually very revealing if joined with another data set. We provide a number of metrics which can increase your understanding of the risk that your data might pose if it were to leak, or if you were to share it intentionally for research purposes. So those are the three pillars that make up Cloud DLP. So let me tell you a little bit about what we've launched new in the last year. DLP has a support for detectors, which are effective at finding common types of private information. And we support custom detectors, which enable you to search for unique business data. But this new feature, Detection Rules, allows you to refine the results found by those detectors by modifying their behavior to reduce noise and increase precision. Let me show you two quick examples. In this case, we have a 
data set that we're going to be de-identifying that has both company email addresses, those owned by my employees, and customer email addresses. I don't want to redact my employee email addresses. In fact, I'd like to leave those alone, and I don't want them to show up in findings reports. By setting up, setting up an exclusion rule, in this case, I've just told it to exclude support at example.com from findings. You can support dictionaries here or regular expressions so that you can exclude these from your findings and only redact your customer email addresses. Here's a second example. In this data example, we have a data set that has names that we'd like to redact. The doctor names aren't important to protect, but the patient names we need to redact. Because they both show up as findings in the normal operating mode, they'd both be redacted as equals. But in this case, I can boost the likelihood of my patient names by including a hot word rule that looks for words nearby the name, in this case, the word patient, and I boost the certainty, and by setting min likelihood to very likely, the only names that will get redacted are my patient names, and the doctor names will be left alone. So for a while now, we've supported custom dictionaries, which were ideal when you had a short list of secretive or sensitive words that you wanted to scan for. But they didn't work if you had a list of words that change frequently or if your list was long. Which brings us to stored dictionaries. Stored dictionaries are easy to update, and they support tens of millions of entries. They're great for things like, as in the picture, user ID dictionaries. There's no pattern or regular expression I can use to detect for these, but if you give me a stored dictionary, I can find these in both your structured and unstructured data. So now that I've given you the ability to fine tune your findings, the next set of features are about modifying what you scan. If you're scanning BigQuery or cloud storage, scanning all of the content may not be necessary. Sometimes a million findings is no more meaningful than one finding. And it's certainly not always the most cost-effective strategy. So with this, we've offered several new ways to sample your data. I'll quickly show two very simple examples. In this example, we're, we're scanning a BigQuery table. And I'm going to limit the scan to select 1,000 rows randomly from the table. Each row is about equally the same to me. And so this allows me to get a sense of what type of private information is in the table. I can do the same thing with Google Cloud Storage. It works a little differently. In this case, I give it a bucket, and I say, select 25% randomly of the files in this bucket, but only scan 200 bytes of those. By doing this quick check, I can, completely, I can check for potential problems without incurring the cost of exhaustive scans. If I join this with scheduled triggers, I can spot check my buckets on a regular cadence to assure there are no regressions as new data is being added to my buckets. Finally, our biggest announcement we have today to share with you is our launch of the beta of our cloud DLP in the console. Here, you'll be able to schedule inspection jobs, manage templates, and evaluate findings, which takes us to our time to demo, where Scott will show you this UI along with all of our other new features. Great. Uh, thank you, Juliana. So I'm going to walk through uh, a lot of the stuff that Juliana just talked about and show you some examples of using our cloud DLP infrastructure kind of in action. Uh, just to get started, uh, we'll start with our UI. I'm just going to walk through creating an inspection job, which is a very um, powerful but a simple thing to do in the UI. So what we see when we get here is we see a list of jobs that we've run. These are uh, situations where we've gone in and inspected something like BigQuery or cloud storage. Uh, we've also got a section called job triggers. Those, again, are jobs that you might trigger or repeat on a regular basis. So I've got a couple examples here of jobs that are going to run in a regular cadence. Maybe you want to run these daily, weekly, monthly, uh, things like that. And you can go in and edit your templates uh, as well. What I'm going to start off, we'll just create a job. And let's see, let's call this. And we're going to go look at cloud storage. And I'm just going to run this job. I'm going to go uh, find a uh, bucket that we have here, which kind of represents a, like a, a shared bucket across our company. It has a lot of different data in there. I simply pick the bucket. I'm going to jump into some of the advanced configuration to show you some of those features that Jordana talked about. Uh, first, you can include and exclude paths. Maybe there's certain file types you don't want to scan or certain ones you only want to scan. But let's go ahead and jump into sampling here. 
So I'm going to pick to do a random sample of the first megabyte of every file in that bucket. And then we'll just select to, to scan about 50% of, uh, of our files in that bucket. So with that simple configuration, Cloud DLP will take care of the rest. It will basically go in, scan that bucket, randomly sample the files. When it finds a file that's in the sample, it's going to only scan a random sample of, the first, of, the, of up to one megabyte. So this gives us a good sample. Now, we might have really large files in there, so this helps us kind of get that spot track. Um, now, for detection, I'm just going to have it scan for a couple different things here. Let's say we look for credit card numbers, email addresses. Uh, let's see here. We'll do social security numbers. Um, and again, these are the built-in types. So just very simply, I can select them, add them in, and go. So the next section here is actions. Now, actions are basically what happens when this job completes. What do I want to do with it? Uh, we can publish a PubSub notification, so you can pick that up and kind of programmatically assess the results. You can save detailed findings to BigQuery. This is a very common option to do, and it's very popular because you actually get the detailed results of the findings. Uh, you can publish to Cloud Security Command Center. If you're familiar with that, it basically is a way to aggregate a lot of signals into one place, or just notify by email job status, job done, things like that. Um, we can set up a schedule to run this periodically, but for this one, I'm just going to run it. We get the configuration there in case you want to uh, use that. And then we just create the job. So again, it's that easy. This job is going to run. It's going to look for the three things that I specified in that config. Um, and then we'll be notified when it's done. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to a trigger that we created earlier. And so again, we just scanned kind of the company share. But I wanted to kind of walk through uh, another common scenario that we see, which is let's imagine that your company has a public web or a website, and you've got assets that power that website that are public, and you want to host those in a cloud storage bucket. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this bucket here. And it's just called company website. And you'll see in that little indicator at the top that it's a public bucket. And we're hosting things like our images, HTML, CSS, maybe some videos, things that we want to share publicly. But one concern I have is I, don't want to, I want to make sure that no employees go in and throw sensitive data in that bucket, because then it would be exposed. So to do that, I've created a trigger that is going to run. And I'll just kind of walk through what that is. So it's going to basically scan that bucket. We're basically looking at the company website bucket. We're going to scan it recursively. And we're going to publish the findings into BigQuery so we can look at the details, what was found, where was it found. And I'm also including an option called include quote. And what that does is it will actually include the quote of the value, because I want to go in and see what was found. And I'm going to lock down that BigQuery table. This is the table under my control. So I'm going to put that in there and lock that down. And you could run this every day. Um, but for this, uh, we're just basically going to run this. And you can do a run now. So clicking run now here will kick off a job and just run it right now. The other thing that I'm doing as well is I'm only scanning the difference. So let me show you what that looks like here. When you do set up a, a um, periodic run, you can basically have it only scan new content. So in this case, because it's my public website, I'm doing an exhaustive scan. But let's say next week when I run it again, or tomorrow when I run it again, I only want to look at things that have changed or things that are new. So the first time I ran this, let me pull up that job here. The first time I ran this, um, I ran on the public website, and it found two things. It found email address and phone number. Now, this wasn't too shocking, because it is a public website. We expect to find something on there. So let me go ahead and look at what that looks like. So I'm going to jump into the detailed findings in BigQuery. And what this does is it takes us directly into the findings for that job. And I have a query here I'm going to run. And as you see in this query, we're basically just selecting a few fields and we're going to limit it to that one job run, because I want to show what that baseline scan looked like. And let's see here. Just scroll this up a little bit. And as you see here, we found two things. We found our company phone number, and we found our company email address. Not a big deal. <laughs> right? That's totally fine. We're happy with that. Um, they're on that particular web page, so that's great. That's our baseline scan. So what I wanted to make sure of is that something didn't change over time. So let's jump back. And let's go back to that trigger. So when I ran this trigger again, the next time, nothing was there. So we just got, again, no results, nothing scanned, no new files. 
But then when I ran it the third time, it looks like something was in there. A bunch of data is now showed up. We saw a huge spike. We saw 10,000 email addresses, 10,000 social security numbers. Um, and we also saw this thing, a hit for what a custom type called a custom design doc. So again, that's very alarming. Clearly, this doesn't sound like something that should be on our public website. And if we dive in and look at the findings here, let's just build a query live here. And I'm just going to look at star. And as we see here, we're actually seeing the raw data. Now, this is all uh, fake data that we made up. But in your real scenario, this is the actual data you can see what it is, you can see where it was. It looks like somebody uploaded in this temp folder an export CSV file that clearly has some sensitive data in it. Um, we also had that one design doc. So we want to try to find out where that is. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the raw SQL in BigQuery, and you can run any kind of analytics you would run in SQL directly here. What that also means is that you can use Data Studio to visualize this data. So I'm going to open up an audit report that we built that was built on top of that uh, SQL query, or that, uh, and that SQL database. And I've just done some very, very simple visualization here. We see we've got some jobs that have run. Um, and I wanted to look at this kind of results here and narrow down where we saw that design doc. So I'm just going to do a very simple filter here. And we see there's a file on in that bucket that looks like it had a hit for a design doc. So let's go see what that looks like. So I'm in my public bucket here, go to that temp folder. We see that export folder that had that CSV with all the personal data. We see a screenshot folder with a bunch of screenshots. And if I open up this one screenshot, what we're seeing here is it looks like somebody took a screenshot of our design doc and uploaded it to the website. And we have a custom type that's looking for our design doc identifiers. So we OCR'd this doc as part of that scan, found our design doc identifier in that doc, and flagged it as a, as a hit. Again, that was a custom design doc uh, detector that we built. So very simply, whether it's through BigQuery, running SQL, or a simple audit report, I'm able to get in and find that information and identify, again, that change between that baseline scan and the next scan. Now, I'm going to go back to one slide here. Now, clearly, if you have a public bucket, finding that data, monitoring for that data is very crucial. But you also might want to prevent it from happening in the first place. Me, me, notify, or me finding out about it like the day after or the week after, again, it's already there. So you can also use DLP to do things like um, scan that data before it gets moved into the bucket. Um, this is a reference architecture. There's a link at the bottom. I know it's a little bit long. But you can find this on our website as well that basically takes you through using DLP and a, what we call kind of a staged bucket approach, where before you move data into a public bucket, you would scan it with DLP and have the results of that job using Cloud Functions actually move the file in to the public bucket or reject it. So that's another way you can apply this technique to prevent the data from getting in in the first place. So now we're going to go to a different demo. We're going to go to an example um, of using DLP we're going to use the UI as well, but we're going to apply it to do something different. We're going to look at BigQuery, and we're going to try to use DLP to basically classify a table. So to get started, let's go look at that table and close a couple tabs here. And in this example, we have a data engineer who uploaded a CSV file. It didn't have a header row, or it just had fields one through seven. We don't know what's in there. Now, with a single table, you can just look at the table and you can figure out what's in there. But imagine if you had thousands of these tables and you wanted to set up a process where you could scan it, look for certain things, sensitive data, and use those findings to try to classify the table. And that's what we're going to do today. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to our uh, DLP triggers page. So I've created this trigger, um, and I'll walk through what that looks like here. So we're basically using this trigger to scan a table I'll show it from here. We're basically going to be scanning that table that I just showed. At, showed. Now, it's a big table, so we don't need to scan the whole thing. We set it up to basically do a random 10% sample. And then we're going to use those results and try to collect, uh, kind of aggregate them to, to guess what the classification is of that table. And let's go back here. And I wanted to load the job that we ran. So when we look at the job results, as you see here, we found a lot of different things. 
So this is just giving us a summary of the data. Credit cards, emails, IP addresses, VIN number, SSN, phone number. And we also set up two custom types. Now these were types similar, if you, if you remember the example that Jordana gave for a large custom dictionary. What we did is we set up our user IDs and we built two big dictionaries, one for our US users and one for our European users. And in this scan, it looks like we found about 7,000 examples of US users and 3,000 of EU users. And that's kind of showing the power of these dictionaries. Those dictionaries themselves had millions and millions of data, uh, of uh, user data in them. In this case, we just did a sample scan of 10,000 rows. And so we found about you know, a good 70, 30 percentage of that. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to jump in and let's look at the actual BigQuery table. Oops, let's see, let me go back mm -hmm. here. And let's just go straight from here from the findings. There we go. So again, in that, in that trigger, what we did is we set this up, we wrote the detailed findings in a BigQuery, and now we're going to go in and look at BigQuery and see if we can use that to understand what's in that, uh, in that table. OK, so I'm going to load a query here and run it. So what this query is doing is it's taking the detailed findings and it's basically collecting all the findings. You're going to get one row for every finding, but it's just doing a simple collect those per field ID because you're going to get the field name, the table column, all that stuff in there. And as we see here, we've basically done that to um, apply that to each field and we see that there's a good pattern here. The first column was our user ID column had, again, that mix of 70-30 of US and European users. We see a VIN number, email address, IP address, phone number, not completely, so not all of them in there hit as a phone number, uh, SSN and credit card number. So again, we're kind of walking through this process manually, but the idea here is if you had thousands of tables, you could go in and apply this sort of programmatically and say, I want to apply this to every new table coming in, validate the schema, or in the case of this one, it really didn't have one, identify if there's any sensitive data in there, and then be able to um, you know, get, get results like this. OK. And so that's applying our large custom dictionaries and also applying kind of a unique use of it to basically go in and classify a BigQuery table. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to show how to apply some of our exclusion rules. And we're going to start off by showing how you, you would use those during a large inspection job, like what, what we've been using the UI for. And then right after, we're going to show how you can apply that same template that we create uh, in a real-time scenario. So first, I want to go back to that first, um, that first bucket that we scanned when we kind of created our own job. So in that bucket, this is like kind of our company share, a lot of stuff's in there. There's a development folder that somebody put a lot of logs in there. And these are supposed to be development logs that the whole company can look at and only have test data in them. But again, we're concerned something might leak in. We want to set up a process to monitor for that data. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go into our data loss prevention section. I have created a job trigger for this. And first, I think what we're going to do, though, is we are going to create, um, we're going to basically do a sample scan. So let me show you the scan that we ran. And what we wanted to do is, before we exhaustively scanned all of that data, we wanted to just do a sample to kind of see the things we found. Again, we expect to find a lot of data that we kind of don't care about, all of our test accounts. So we want to see what that looks like. So what I did is I created a job. We ran this job, only looked for email addresses. And as you see, even in that sample, we found 21,000 email addresses. These are log files. Not a big surprise that there's a lot of emails in there. But we want to get a sense of what these look like. So again, right from here, we're going to jump into BigQuery. Let's run a query here, and we will see what they look like. So as we see, a lot of emails are coming in across all of our log files, but they all have this testdlp.com email address in there, which is our test accounts. So we're, we're good. We're happy with that. But again, if I run this job every day and it comes up with 21,000 findings or 30,000 findings, it's not going to be very useful for me when most of those are ones I don't care about. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to create an exclusion template. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. We're going to show a code sample here. What I'm doing here is I'm using our API Explorer. I'm going to pull up and show you kind of in detail what that looks like and how simple it is. So in this example, we're showing kind of the JSON 
um, representation of a template. And we simply turned on three types that we cared about, email address, credit card, and social security number. And at the bottom, we created a, a rule, an exclusion rule, that simply says, if you see testdlp.com in the result of an email address, partial match, just ignore it. That way, the prefix, the username, whatever it is, we don't care. It'll match on the, on the suffix, and we'll be good. I'm going to leave that one up. Go to my job triggers page. So that's the template that we want to use now for our ongoing periodic scan. And that way, the findings that we get will be meaningful to us. So we set those up in a template, in a, in a trigger. We are going to use um, this email exclude template that we just created, that we just showed you. We're going to do a, an exhaustive scan now, because again, we want to make sure that there isn't that one email address or two email addresses leaking into our logs. So we did the sample scan to figure out what was going on, get a sense of what was there. Now we did the exhaustive scan to search for everything. And let's see what happened. We're going to open up the job. And it looks like we found two email addresses. So this is actually useful, right? We went from 21,000 in, in a small sample scan, and now we've scanned about you know, 620, 26 megabytes of log files that are up there, and we found two email addresses. So these are probably ones we really care about and want to go look at. So I'm going to jump into the findings here. And let's see here. And just open up this saved query. What I'm doing here is I'm basically looking at just the results here for that last scan that we did. And again, it's uh, sample data here, but these are two that are not part of our test set. It's the same email address showed up twice in this one log, prod test logs five. So clearly, that prod test logs five maybe wasn't a dev log and shouldn't have been in there. And again, we've been able to very easily identify that using exclusion lists, weeding out all the stuff we didn't care about. Now, to do that, again, we use this exclusion rule. Uh, we applied it to when we did this large scan, where we basically went in scanned 600 and something megabytes of data, applied it in a large operation. But that template is very useful. Again, that, that holds the configuration of what you care about, what you're looking for. What we're going to do next is we're going to use that template, and we're going to apply it in another scenario. We're going to show how that same template, same exclusion rule, can be used in real time. To do that, I'm going to pull open a sample application that we built. And I'm just going to load. This is a a live classification demo that we built on App Engine. What it's doing is it's taking the data that's on the left box and automatically applying one of our DLP inspection and transforms, and then putting the output in the right box. So what we see here is a sample chat um, where we've got one of our agents talking to a customer, and we simply said, look for a bunch of stuff and just redact it when you find it. So on the right side, you see all the emails have been replaced with email address, SSNs with the US Social Security number, and credit cards replaced. But again, we want to apply that template now, because we didn't really want to hide our agent's name. We want to know who that is. And in this case, the James at testdlp.com was hidden, because we just treated it as, a, as, a, as an email address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here. I'm going to load this template. This is the, hold on a second. Let's see, template name. I'm going to take this template name that we created. And in our live kind of real-time demo, we have the ability just to paste in a template. So we're showing we're not going to go edit the code. We're just simply going to have the, the application use a different template. I'm going to paste it in here. And so now if I go back to this and update it, what you see is the right side refreshed as soon as I type something in. And now we are no longer excluding the James at testdlp.com. So again, just showing that that one same template that we created from, copied straight from the inspect job Applied here, you can use it in, in all of your kind of pipelines and workflows and have that consistency and not have to go in and change code. Um, just simply reference a different resource. Um, and again, that's showing our exclusion rules. Uh, there's a lot more power that you can do as well, creating your own custom types, exclusion rules, combining those together. All of that, again, no matter how simple or complex it is, can be saved as a template and then reused across your workflows.